As the culture surrounding mental health continues to evolve within our society, we've seen a parallel shift in the arts, including video games. Indie developers have been especially in tune with this shift, being regular people or small teams, focused more on meticulously crafting their game's narratives since they aren't big companies chasing the almighty dollar. Because of this, we have been given wonderful games like Stardew Valley and Celeste, games that are enjoyable to play but do not shy away from uncomfortable subject material. I appreciate that these developers were brave enough to juxtapose their beautiful art with mental health topics like depression, PTSD, and substance abuse. It says a lot about who they are as people. I feel that games like this are a new way to get the message across to the public that it's okay to struggle. You aren't broken, you aren't alone, and you aren't unworthy of love. Dealing with the hardships of life does not make you any less human. I tip my cap to developers like these. As the title of this video suggests, I lost my 13-year-old daughter to suicide in June of 2023. In the wake of her death, my perspective on basically everything in life has changed. Time, love, money, art, none of these things are what they used to be. As I stumble forward, desperately trying to piece together some semblance of a new life, I find myself not only playing video games as a means of distracting myself, I also appreciate aspects of gaming that I didn't pay much attention to in the past. That brings us to Amori. I've been aware of this game's existence for years, but it just didn't seem like the kind of game I'd be into. Don't get me wrong, I love RPGs. They are perhaps my all-time favorite genre of games. But as someone who's used RPG Maker for over 20 years, I'm painfully aware of its reputation. While I love RPG Maker, and have always had a lot of fun with it, it has produced an endless number of, well, subpar games. Because Omori was created using RPG Maker, I was admittedly a skeptic of it. But as I said, my daughter's death has changed my perspective on a lot of things. Gaming has become an integral part of my grieving process, so it's only fair that I dedicate some time and energy into the games that I've had an emotional connection with since losing Allison. I figured it was time to give this game a fair shot. Before we go any further, let me briefly explain what this game is. There are countless videos on YouTube that chronicle the development of Omori, so I'll spare you most of those details. In short, Omori is an RPG published in 2020 by indie developer Omocat after six years of development and became an instant cult classic. Based on the creator's webcomic series of the same name, Omori follows the story of a young boy named Sunny who, in the wake of his sister's death and apparent suicide by hanging, has become a hikikomori, a term used in Japan to describe people who have completely isolated themselves from the outside world. The game's narrative has a heavy focus on serious emotional and mental health topics like depression, anxiety, guilt, trauma, and suicide. Maybe playing a game with this type of subject material was a mistake after losing my daughter, but if I was ever going to give this game a fair chance and feel any real resonance from its message, this was as good a time as any. Welcome to Gaming with Grief. Like many RPGs, Amori's gameplay takes place in two different ways. Exploration of an overworld and a separate window for combat. Exploration takes a slight departure from the conventional as there are actually multiple worlds to explore. White space, a bright barren void inside of Sunny's mind. Head space, a colorful world born of Sunny's memories where he spends time with his friends and late sister Mari. Black space, a horror themed desolate world of darkness. And the real world, where the player is able to piece together the real events of the story. Each world is visibly and audibly distinct from the others. In fact, let's take a minute to discuss this game's art before we go any further. Right off the bat, it's clear that the developers, especially Omocat, have a background in visual art. Omori has a charming, very distinct art style, utilizing a simple, pencil-drawn approach with subdued pastel colors. It creates a sort of whimsical, cartoon-like world, or rather worlds. I feel that this enhances the game's immersion by pronouncing the differences in atmosphere between white space headspace, black space, and the real world, the town of Faraway. As a seasoned RPG Maker user, I have an even deeper appreciation for what this team was able to accomplish visually, limited to a simple tile-based map toolset and a few scripts for parallaxing. They created a truly unique world with very few tools at their disposal. 
RPG Maker, like many visually equivalent game development tools, also limits a developer's ability to show character emotions and interactions. By default, characters have a three-frame walking animation and can only move in four directions. This means that the artists have to do a ton of extra legwork to bring characters to life, drawing multiple sprite sheets and faces to broaden the range of emotions that we, the players, see. Other games like Sea of Stars and Shovel Knight are great examples of games in which developers went the extra mile to make sure that, despite a limited number of pixels, characters are emotive and environments are rich and full. Visually, the game knows when to be bright and silly or dark and serious, and the art style allows the narrative to dance back and forth between the two effortlessly. Omocat, Minced, and Ems all deserve commendation for their hard work on this game's aesthetic. Clearly inspired by other RPGs like Earthbound, Amori utilizes turn-based combat and an emotion rock-paper-scissors system, not unlike the types in Pokemon games. Characters experience emotions in battle which act like status conditions, except that each emotion has a weakness and resistance to the others. Angry increases attack but lowers defense, sad increases defense but lowers speed, and happy increases luck and speed but lowers accuracy. There is also neutral, the baseline emotion that has no effects. Angry beats sad, sad beats happy, and happy beats angry. A character's life or HP is denoted as heart, and skill points are denoted as juice. Your characters equip weapons like stuffed animals and cooking utensils to raise attack power, and trinkets like jewelry and clothing to boost defense. Additionally, an energy gauge fills up during battle as your team takes damage. These energy points can be used to do follow-up attacks, cooperative abilities between two or more characters to deal extra damage to enemies, inflict buffs or debuffs, or heal some of your party. Amori gives you just enough options during battle to keep the game fun and engaging without the player feeling overwhelmed by having to learn a complicated battle system. To me, this is one of RPG Maker's strengths, and I'm glad they leaned into it. Now that we've covered the basics, let's get into the story itself. When booting up the game, you are met with the text. Don't worry, everything is going to be okay. You see a boy sitting on the floor in the dark with his head buried in his knees, and another trying to console him. I can't tell you how many times I've felt this very same way since my daughter died. Fifteen seconds in, and I can already tell that this is going to be a very emotional experience. The game begins with the titular character Omori awakening in white space, a barren void with only a few objects to interact with, including a box of tissues and a sketchbook. A door soon appears, and Amori enters it to find himself in the colorful, dreamlike world of headspace, met by his three childhood friends, Aubrey, Kel, and Hiro. This is where most of the gameplay of Amori takes place. Let's quickly talk about each member of the team. Aubrey is sweet and very strong-willed. She is not afraid to speak her mind and could be considered the bravest of the group. She also often bickers with Kel who seems to have a knack for getting on her nerves. Aubrey is primarily an attacker in battle and gains the ability to destroy heavy objects in the field. Kel is your typical lunkhead, the athletic type who is loud, clumsy, and very extroverted. For all of his faults, you truly won't find a more loyal friend with a better heart. I wanted to dislike Kel at first, but he has a way of growing on you. Kel is a balanced fighter with a few attacks that hit more than one enemy. He can also throw balls at things like statues and switches to help you traverse the world of headspace. Lastly, Hero is the oldest of the group and Kel's older brother. He's calm, rational, and very charming, all of which he uses to break up quarrels between Aubrey and Kel. He's very much the peacekeeper of the team. Hero is mostly a support character, with several cooking skills at his disposal to restore the team in battle. The four kids set out for the nearby park to meet their friend Basil and Amori's older sister, Mari, for a picnic. Once they arrive, the team decides to play a game of hide-and-seek with another group of kids at the park, after which they head to Basil's house to look at his photo album together. It's here that Basil drops a photo he doesn't recognize at first. Just as he begins to realize what it is, the game gives us our first taste of its horror element, and Amori is whisked back to the safety of white space, only this time, there's not a door for him to leave. He instead stabs himself with a knife and awakens back in the real world as Sunny. You can think of Amori as Sunny's alter ego in a way. It's here we find out that Sunny and his mom are moving away in three days. Sunny has been left home alone to finish his chores and moving preparations before leaving. 
This is where the lines between realities start to blur. It becomes apparent that Sonny is under the duress of some sort of significant mental trauma, and white space is the quiet, uncomplicated asylum created within his own mind to protect himself. Sonny descends a staircase into abysmal darkness, where he is met with one of his first terrifying encounters with an unknown creature of pure terror. Defeated, Sonny makes his way back to bed, where he once again awakens in white space. He again enters the door and returns to headspace. Back in headspace, Amori rejoins with his friends, only to find out that now Basil is missing. Overwhelmed with concern over their lifelong friend's well-being, the four of them set out on an adventure through headspace to try to find him. The first locale the team explores is the Pinwheel Forest. This is pretty standard RPG fare. Explore a happy, forest-themed area littered with rabbit and plant-based monsters early in the game. At the end of the forest, they encounter a giant ladder that they decide to climb, forcing Amori to face his first of many fears, heights. This will be a common theme of Amori's development throughout the story. At the top of the ladder lies Otherworld Camp, a quaint hillside village full of interesting residents and a recycling machine that was clearly inspired by the save robot from Mario Paint. The team asks around for clues to Basil's whereabouts, but to no avail. Instead, they meet the bedridden space boyfriend and, after agreeing to go on a search for a lost mixtape, make their way to the nearby junkyard. The junkyard could be considered the game's first dungeon, full of conveyor belt puzzles and locked doors. The enemies here are all discarded electronics, cassette tapes, boom boxes, computers, etc. It's here that they also meet the Kool-Aid, I mean, the Life Jam guy, who sells this game's version of a revive item, Life Jam. Which is kind of cute because when your characters die, they are turned to toast. The boss enemy of this area is the Download Window, a computer program that has seemingly gone haywire. After defeating it and recovering the mixtape, they leave the junkyard where they meet Pluto, a rogue planet who decides to open up a convenient means of fast travel for the team. Returning to Space Boyfriend's ship, the mixtape ends up sending him into a frenzy and the team has no choice but to battle him. After the battle, they leave the Otherworld camp and head into Cattail Field, where Amori chases a shadowy apparition of Basil that leads him to a lonely barn. Inside, he disappears into a large picture and finds himself on a tall, dark staircase. At the top, Amori finds a music stand with sheet music that has been scribbled out. Seeing it triggers some sort of internal trauma and once again, the game's horror elements surface. The fear sends him back to the sanctuary of white space. Amori again stabs himself and awakens in the real world. Three days remain until he moves away. Sonny awakens to knocking at his door. It's Kel, coming to see if he can coax Sonny out for a visit before he moves away. We start to piece together that in the real world, Mari passed away four years ago and her death drove everyone apart. This is the first of many parallels between this game and my experience. Grief has a terrible way of dividing you and the people in your life. Kel, being the lovable oaf that he is, attempts to drag Sonny out of the house for one last adventure together. Of note, you can choose not to answer the door at all and just go to bed, essentially skipping a huge portion of the story. The game gives you several choice-based opportunities to do this, though certain choices can prevent you from getting the quote-unquote real ending. It's worth mentioning that on my playthrough, there were many optional areas and side quests that I either didn't record footage of or didn't pursue altogether. There's plenty of content off the beaten path of this game's main story for those of you that are interested. It turns out that Hiro has been off attending college and is coming home for a visit, so Kel and Sonny run errands to go get him a welcome back gift. On their way home, they pass the park, where they see Basil being bullied by the now pink-haired Aubrey and her new group of ruffian friends. After a little tussle with Aubrey, the boys walk Basil back home. Basil then confesses that Aubrey took his photo album and refuses to return it, though the details are a little fuzzy. Sonny and Cal go on a search for Aubrey to retrieve the album and find her at the church. After a very uncomfortable confrontation, Aubrey storms out. The boys follow and catch her, just as she's throwing the photo album in the trash, which the boys recover. After returning the album to Basil, his caretaker Polly invites the boys in to stay for dinner. During the meal, Kel discloses that Sonny is moving away in three days. Clearly bothered by this, Basil excuses himself to the bathroom. 
Sonny follows to check on him when, once again, things become dark and scary very quickly. Basil is somehow involved in this trauma that is affecting Sonny, but it's not yet clear how or why. Unable to help Basil, Sonny returns home to an equally frightening scene. He again confronts the physical manifestation of his trauma, but is unable to defeat it and returns to white space. Again leaving white space through the door and returning to headspace, Amori rejoins his friends who collectively continue their search for Basil. They head into the Pyrefly Forest, a maze-like labyrinth of spider-infested trees. After solving a few puzzles and repairing an old minecart track, they reach the Sprout Mole Village. After helping a few of the silly little plant people, the group enters Sweetheart's Castle to watch a live bachelorette type of show. After a series of ridiculously comical events, something that this game does well to balance out its darker themes, the group is thrown into Sweetheart's dungeon where they must escape. Sweetheart's castle, including the dungeon and courtyard, is a huge area, perhaps the biggest dungeon in the game. After what feels like forever, the group finally makes it out and returns to the stage where they battle Sweetheart. In yet another strange turn of events, Space Boyfriend shows up and sweeps Sweetheart off her feet. She then blows up her stage saying that they don't need it anymore, and the group jumps down into the hole. Amori is separated from the others and left to explore a dark library, giving us our first true set of clues into the real-world events of Sunny's trauma if we as the player are able to discern the redacted names in the books. Normally, tedious tasks like this in video games is something I would just pass by, but I was captivated by the story at this point. Playing Amori is like reading a book, a book that I didn't want to put down because despite how painful some of it was to experience, I understood and related to that pain. Omori has a vision of Basil and is shown the back of a photograph, on which is taped a key and the words, don't forget, it's in the toy box. Omori again returns to white space, where he stabs himself and awakens his sonny in the real world. Before I go any further, I want to stop and talk about this game's sound design a little bit. The soundtrack for Omori was composed by Slime Girls, Clover, and Bo N. The trio often favors simple, chip tuny melodies, nostalgic of games like Earthbound and Animal Crossing. Just like with the visuals, sometimes less is more, and the music melds perfectly with the art style. This game boasts a truly impressive catalog even for an RPG, with over 170 tracks in total. The tracks that are supposed to convey peace, quiet, or calmness utilize light acoustic strings and flittering flutes and whistles underscored by simple piano melodies. They often sound like they were made with toy instruments, which I find very charming. You can't help but feel a calm sadness. Even though Amori is considered to be a horror game, the team was able to sonically capture positive emotions as well. The developers also cleverly placed the melody from White Space, one of the game's simplest but most important tracks, into some of its other songs, sometimes so discreetly that you'll miss it if you aren't paying attention. I like little easter eggs like this. It was a great creative choice as it allows them to keep the sound more cohesive and utilize a fantastic tune more than once. Amori also knows when to lean into more traditional RPG music when necessary. The game uses several different battle themes depending on which area of the game you're in one of which being Tussle Among the Trees, an upbeat, choppy tune that sounds like it was taken straight from a Kirby game. Tracks like this showcase that the game can play to every color on the emotional spectrum, not just the dark, somber blues of sadness. Honestly, the team could facilitate a masterclass in using simple music to convey emotion and set the mood, especially when it comes to using a lack of sound. Some tracks have almost no melody at all, favoring a quiet, haunting, hypnotic Sith to create a feeling of perpetual dread. Being able to create darker atmospheres in this way is critical for games like Amori that use horror elements to tell the story. Again, player immersion is vital for games conveying such an emotional narrative. If you're able to, play this game with headphones on. Several songs are enriched with deep bass lines, ethereal bells and beeps, 
and audio panning that you may miss without them. My personal favorite tracks are Tussle Among the Trees, Poems in the Fog, and Three Bar Logos. Back to the story, Kel returns to drag Sonny out of the house. Today is the day that Hero is coming home from college, and Kel has been tasked with picking up some food for the occasion. He asks Sonny to tag along. The boys get the food and return to Kel's house when Polly shows up asking if they've seen Basil. Concerned, the boys set out to find him and head to the lake at the park, a place that used to be the group's secret hangout spot. They arrive just in time to break up another dispute between Basil and Aubrey, who, in a fit of rage, accidentally pushes Basil into the lake. Knowing that Basil can't swim, Sonny jumps in to try and save him. It turns out that not only is Sonny also a poor swimmer, but he has a phobia of water. In another dark, dreamlike stupor, Sonny finds himself back in his house, only this time it's underwater. He finds Mari on the stairs and gives chase, descending into the darkest depths where he eventually blacks out. The waves of grief often feel like drowning. Sonny awakens back at the lake to see a familiar face, Hero, who arrived just in the nick of time to pull both him and Basil from the water. The boys rush Basil back home to Polly where he is safely returned to recover. They then return to Kel and Hero's house where they have dinner and look through the photo album again. The boys decide to sleep over at Sonny's one last night since he's leaving soon. Once settled in, Sonny drifts off and returns yet again to white space. When he enters headspace, Sonny is not immediately met by his friends as usual. He wanders around for a bit and returns to the park, but again, nobody is there, not even Mari on her picnic blanket. Eventually, Amori finds her at the dock where she suggests that they cross the water to look for the others. The two swim through a vast water veiled by thick fog until they reach the other side. Mari commends Amori for conquering some of his fears so far. Spiders, heights, water, but then notes that he still has one fear left to face. One that will be a little bit harder to overcome. Continuing on, they reach a white window where Mari says her final goodbye to Amori. The window is replaced by a whirlpool that leads Amori to a well. He descends into the well where he reaches Deep Well, an underwater area that you can't convince me wasn't inspired by rock bottom from SpongeBob SquarePants. After exploring Deep Well a bit, Amori finds Kel, who explains that the rest of the group all ended up getting jobs at the nearby casino, Last Resort. The two explore the casino and are reunited with the rest of the group, but it seems as though they are all starting to forget what they were doing and how they got there in the first place, including their search for Basil. A side note here, this is one of my personally greatest fears, forgetting. I've seen so many people get old and forget most of their lives and that terrifies me to no end. My memories are so very precious to me, a window into my life in which my daughter was still here with me. I can't think of any crueler fate than not being able to remember her and the love that she gave me. Once the team is reunited, they try to quit their jobs and leave the casino when they are stopped by Mr. Jossum the cutthroat tycoon who runs the business with an iron fist. Refusing to let them break their contracts, he battles the group but eventually concedes, forcing them to battle his true number one employee, Pluto. After a difficult fight with a literal planet, they leave Last Resort and head back to Deepwell to continue their journey to find Basil. They traverse weathered bridges and underwater caverns and eventually find Humphrey, a seemingly friendly whale who invites them inside his belly, which serves as the game's last real dungeon. Inside of the mighty whale reside three witches, Molly, Marina, and Medusa, and according to Humphrey, Sweetheart is also inside, paying the three witches a visit for who knows what reason. Humphrey's insides are an expansive maze of winding rivers, button puzzles, and digestive hazards. After exploring the whale's cavernous insides, the group discovers that Sweetheart has come to solicit the help of the witches to make her a perfect partner, following her breakup with Space Boyfriend. Each of the three witches creates a different clone of her, but each time Sweetheart storms out, unsatisfied with their work. In a final confrontation, Sweetheart escapes and leaves Amori and the team stuck with the bill for the witches' hard work, a million clams. Unable to pay, the group is forced to battle the witches. After the fight, it's revealed that the reason they needed so much money in the first place was to feed Humphrey with. Now he's hungry and not happy about it. 
Humphrey swallows the witches and tries to also swallow our heroes. After yet another battle, the team escapes the hungry whale's insides and they find the last black key to complete the hangman game, revealing the message, Welcome to Black Space. We are shown a scene of Basil's house, now dark and dilapidated. Is this where we're supposed to go now? The team descends into a whirlpool left in Humphrey's wake and traverses an odd pink underground river. A mysterious voice speaks to Omori, referring to him as the dreamer and reminding him of the terrible thing he was about to face. Whatever awful trauma he was exposed to, whatever unforgivable act he committed, the time to stop running from it to the safety of white space is quickly approaching. Through the river, the group find themselves in Neighbor's Room, where all of their adventures in headspace have begun. They walk the wooded trail to Basil's house, again giving chase to a shadowy apparition of him. This time, all of the flowers along the way are dead and can't be revived. Basil explains why he planted the flowers in the first place. Each of them represents one of the main characters. Roses represent Hero, who is universally loved. Cacti flowers represent Cal because he is hardy and resilient, things like that. It is also a stern reminder of the finality of death, something I still struggle to understand and accept in the wake of my daughter's death. I hate that death is so mysterious and permanent, but respect that this game at least acknowledges that fact. The group reaches Basil's house, overgrown with black vines and the floor gone, opened into a seemingly bottomless pit. Amori plummets into the darkness. Welcome to Black Space. Amori, now without Aubrey, Kel, and Hero, lands in a black ocean. He swims to shore and navigates a forest path covered in thick spider webs. He continues forward, cutting the webs with his knife as he goes. The forest gives way to another staircase. At the top is Mari, resting peacefully in a clear coffin atop a bed of white orchids. It's truly a sight to behold. It brought me to tears. Amori, Sunny, clearly loves and reveres his sister so much that even in black space, the darkest part of his mind, a hallowed spot to preserve Mari remains. I relate to this too. There is a lot of darkness related to my grief and trauma that I'm still sorting through. I probably will be for the rest of my life. But despite that, the memory of my daughter is so deeply precious to me, I would do anything to preserve it. As Amori approaches Mari, she changes into the shadowy apparition and quickly disappears, leaving behind a black door. He enters the heart of black space, an inverted copy of white space. Inside are countless doors, each leading to a disturbed, distorted place within Sunny's psyche. Each locale is unique, and the creative art style of the game is dialed to an 11 here. It's actually unnerving to be here, totally severed from the colorful, silly world of headspace. Amori explores door after door, delving deeper and deeper into his trauma with each knob turned. Many of the doors lead to Basil, who, despite being relieved to see Amori each time, ends up being killed in one way or another. These scenes represent Basil's feelings of being abandoned by Sunny in the wake of their trauma. It begs the question, who is trying to save who? Eventually, a new door bathed in an eerie red light appears. This is it, the end of black space. Inside this crimson void, Amori finds another version of Basil, detained by the same red hands that occupy white space. Basil begs Amori for help, but without words or hesitation, Amori stabs Basil. I couldn't believe what I was seeing when I played this part. Amori steps forward and descends another set of stairs where a throne of red hands awaits him at the top. He seats himself, now the king of black space. Sunny has lost control. Is Amori doing this to protect Sunny once and for all? Has he become fully sentient and drunk with power? At this moment, Sunny wakes up having fallen out of bed from the nightmare. Kel is still in his room asleep, having not heard the thump of Sunny hitting the floor. Hero, however, is gone. Sunny wanders around the dark house and comes across the piano room, an area of the house he'd previously refused to enter if you tried. Mari, dressed in all white, is seated at the piano, playing a soft, sad waltz. She recounts her and Sunny playing together, practicing for a recital they were supposed to perform. She apologizes for pushing him so hard. Just then, Hiro enters to find Amori alone. 
He reminisces of Mari, saying he can't understand why she chose to leave the way she did. I have this same thought every day, Hiro. After a short talk, the boys go back to bed. Sonny awakens, and it is now his last day in Far Away. During breakfast the next morning, one of Aubrey's new friends, Kim, shows up at Sonny's and asks the boys to go visit Aubrey at her house. After the incident at the lake with Basil, Aubrey has holed herself up in her bedroom and won't come out or talk to anybody. The boys commit a little bit of B&E and go upstairs where they find Aubrey, who is thrilled to see them in her house uninvited. During a long discussion, it comes to light that Aubrey has possession of the missing photos from Basil's album, the ones that have Mari in them. The four of them sit down together and replace the photos in the album, giving us, the player, yet another chance to peek into their lives of days past. I really like this approach. Unlike games where you just read about what happened or watch a black and white cutscene from the past, we piece together history during an active task. This is an effective and engaging way to not only discern what happened in the story, it's also a look into each character and their unique personality. They return the album to its former glory, aside from one missing picture. The four teammates, now somewhat reconciled and reformed, decide to go check on Basil and apologize. Upon arriving at Basil's house, Polly tells the group that Basil isn't home. He's visiting his grandmother in the hospital. As a means of passing time until he returns, they decide to go back to Sonny's house, where they end up in his backyard. What used to be a common hangout spot, including their secret treehouse, is now a quiet and hallowed place. A lonely stump sits in the back of the yard, the only remnants of the tree that Mari's body was found hanging from. I know that feeling, to look upon the place where someone you love left this earth. It's a very heavy thing to carry in your heart and mind. After pausing to pay their respects and briefly discuss the day of Mari's death, they continue on into the treehouse. Nostalgia of days past washes over them. It's here that Sonny finds the missing photo from the album taped to the wall, and on the back of it, the key, and the note, don't forget, it's in the toy box. Suddenly, Aubrey rushes out of the treehouse, and the boys follow. Back outside, Aubrey places a pinwheel in the stump and begins discussing an important and often overlooked part of her grief, her anger. She expresses how angry she felt that the world kept turning after Mari died, how left behind she felt. I understand that all too well. When my daughter died, I became angry too. The passing of time became foreign to me. I couldn't understand how people just moved on when my world had stopped. If this sounds familiar to you, it's okay to be angry after suffering great loss. And if you don't quite understand, well, that's okay too. Just try to be patient if you know someone who is. Aubrey continues on to tell the story of the day she took the album from Basil. After Mari died, she asked Basil to come over and spend some time with him. Though he reluctantly agreed, Basil acted distant and left shortly after they got to his room. While he was gone, Aubrey saw the album and decided to look through it. She opened it only to find that Basil had blacked out all of the faces with a marker. Furious, she decided to take the album for herself at that point in order to stop him from doing any more damage to what was left of her memory of Mari and the happier days behind them. Remorseful for what she'd done and how she treated Basil, Aubrey falls to the ground in tears. Kel and Hero move closer to comfort her, but Sonny steps away. The group regathers themselves and decide to head back to Basil's. Polly answers the door again and tells them that, although Basil is back home, he went straight to his room and shut the door. Concerned, she invites the group in to see if they can talk to him. Though they don't get a reply when calling to him through his bedroom door, they decide to sleep in the living room in order to be there in case Basil comes out. Kel, Aubrey, Hero, and Sonny each drift off. Once again, we find ourselves in white space, but this time, things are different. There is no rug, no box of tissues, no sketchbook. And we are Sonny, not Amori. Sonny steps forward to find the familiar set pieces, and Amori there waiting for him. Amori stands in place ominously, unmoving except for his eyes which follow Sonny everywhere he walks. Sonny only has one option, to destroy the black light bulb that creates the safety that is white space. He does so and the room goes black, and the shadowy figure emerges for the final battle for Sonny's mind. 
During the battle, the figure transforms multiple times, taking the shape of Sonny's worst fears. All he can do is face his trauma and try to calm himself. Eventually, the figure changes to that of a girl dressed in white, her dark hair covering her face, suspended from the ground. Sonny does not shy away this time, and the shadow relents, leaving behind a now purified white light bulb. Sonny picks it up and is transported to a hazy path through the forest. At the end of the path, Basil sits beneath a large tree. He is again relieved to see his friend Sonny, but goes on to give a disheartening message that it may be too late and that it will be hard to accept the truth of that day. He tells Sonny that he has to stay strong. It's clear that both Basil and Sonny have been running from something since Mari died and that it has been tearing each of them apart in different ways. He gives Sonny a new, empty photo album and Sonny continues on, collecting new pictures to fill it with, but these pictures are different. They are dark, distorted, and hard to make out. Sonny continues through more dark, hellish dreamscapes. His living room, a hospital bay with rows of dying patients, and finally a dark stage, collecting more pictures along the way and placing them into the album. He eventually comes upon another large tree, only this one has a noose hanging from it. It's here he finds the last photo. We now discover what really happened the day that Mari died. Placing the photos back in order reveals the terrible truth. Mari did not die by suicide. The day of the recital, Mari and Sonny got into an argument at the top of the stairs when Sonny pushed her. Mari fell down the stairs, breaking her neck. Overwhelmed and in shock at what he had done, Sonny falls apart. Basil arrives to find Sonny in a state of panic and, in a desperate attempt to try and protect him, helps Sonny move Mari's body outside where they hanged her from a tree to make it look like a suicide. My heart can't take this. Let's pause. <sighs> okay. Sonny awakens back in Basil's living room and goes upstairs to again check on him. In Basil's room, the boys together confront the shadow, known only as something. What a terrible, awful, accurate visual representation of what trauma, guilt, and anguish can feel like. Sonny and Basil are both consumed by a maelstrom of violent memories and emotion, struggling to save themselves and each other. Unable to do anything else, they attack each other until eventually Basil stabs Sonny in the eye. He blacks out. Ambulance sirens can be heard in the background. Sonny then finds himself wandering his neighborhood in a fugue state. He returns to his house to find Basil there waiting for him. Basil apologizes for causing him so much trouble and explains that all he ever really wanted to do was protect him. Basil gives his friend one last hug and walks away. Sonny enters his house, remembering the key he found on the photograph. On the way to the closet where the toy box rests, he returns to the piano room one last time to find Mari seated, playing the same sweet, soft waltz. She leaves him with a short but powerful message. Know that I'll always be watching over you, okay? As long as you remember me, I'll be there. It makes me wonder if my daughter has the same thought, wherever she is now. Sonny enters the closet and opens the toy box. Inside, he finds his violin smashed to pieces, strands of Mari's hair still tangled in its strings along with sheet music, the song he and Mari were supposed to play for their recital, Stained with Blood. He leaves the house to find himself on a long stretch of highway, running through the rain. Memories of days gone play, showing us the happier time when Mari was still alive and the six friends were practically inseparable. It's really a beautiful thing to watch. It reminds me to try to do the same with my daughter, focus on the beautiful memories I have with her, not the fact that she's gone. After the memories replay, Sonny is returned to the stage. Kel, Aubrey, and Hero are already there, waiting to cheer him on. The room dims. A spotlight shines on Sonny. He pulls out his violin, now repaired by the good memories he just relived, and plays the song he and Mari were supposed to play together the day she died. He falls to his knees, tears streaming down his face. The time has finally come to let go of the guilt and face what he's done. He returns to white space for the last time. Amori is there waiting, knife in hand. This is it. The end. 
the true battle with himself. Sonny must rid himself of this thick, heavy shield that has weighed him down while protecting him all these years. The two exchange blows, Sonny barely managing to keep his heart up against Amori's deadly stabbing. Even more painful are the words he spouts, calling Sonny a coward and a liar. Now more than ever, it's apparent that Amori represents one's dark and depressive thoughts. That voice in your head that tells you to quit. That you're worthless. That you're not loved. We all have that Amori inside of us. But please, don't listen to him. Even if you've trusted him to protect you in time of crises. The fight ends with Amori overpowering Sunny. Game over. I thought I had actually done something wrong and lost the fight, but in reality, the game pulled yet another clever trick to immerse me, the player. Just like Sunny, you have to heed Basil's advice and keep going, even when you think you've been defeated. By not choosing to quit, the game continues. Sonny gets back on his feet and readies his violin. Mari appears, seated at her piano. The next sequence might be one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in a video game. Mari and Sonny, together again, play the song they never got to play. As their soft song fills your heart, memories of their life together play like an old home movie. They grow up, grow close, make memories with their friends. They plant flowers that bloom wildly, just like the love they all shared with each other. It's here that I understood that so much of Headspace was created with Mari and her love as the main inspiration. Treasure chests are watermelons, Mari's favorite fruit, one they used to eat together on the beach. Characters appear to be mostly purple because it was Mari's favorite color. She even had plans with Aubrey to dye her hair purple. I found a new beauty in Headspace's odd whimsy that I didn't see at first. The song ends, and Mari and her memory ascend beyond the white window. She is finally resting in peace. Sonny then does the most powerful thing he could. He hugs Amori. The two embrace. Amori, with a look of understanding and contentment at his defeat, drops the knife and disappears once and for all. Sonny leaves through the door of white space for the last time. It's over. Sonny awakens in the hospital, his right eye covered in a bandage. Still in a haze, he leaves his hospital room and heads down the hallway. He reaches an intersection and is given one last choice. To pursue the headspace versions of his friends, or follow Basil to check on him. A neat detail that I didn't catch until I watched my playthrough footage is that the hospital is laid out exactly like the neighborhood of Faraway is, the hallways representing the streets and the doors representing the houses. Sonny enters Basil's room where he finds Aubrey, Kel, and Hero at his bedside. The trio turns to Sonny who gives us the story's final words. I have to tell you something. Roll credits. Wow, what a story. What an experience. So let's get to what most of you probably clicked on this video to hear. How did I feel playing Amori? The answer is complicated. I'm going to be honest with you. Playing Amori was one of the hardest things I've done since burying my daughter. She loved this game. The emotional parallels between her situation and the game's story are nothing short of heartbreaking. One thing that I've struggled with, that any parent that loses a child to suicide struggles with, is guilt. I feel so overwhelmingly guilty for not being able to protect her from herself. I worried that her being exposed to content like Amori was detrimental to her mental health. A part of me hates this game for being so dark, and hates myself even more for not paying more attention to her playing it. But let me be clear, I understand that that train of thought isn't totally rational, and I do not blame this game for my daughter's death. My daughter died of a medical condition. Though it's shown in a very dark way, dealing with trauma and guilt are one of this game's most powerful messages. Both Sonny and Basil are stricken with overwhelming guilt that manifests itself into terrifying, nebulous creatures that do real harm to them. I understand how this feels and appreciate how well this game conveys that feeling. So if I feel so negatively towards it, why even play it in the first place? I suppose I did it mostly for some perspective. This playthrough was cathartic in a way. I didn't ever think I'd be able to play this game. Ever. I never thought I'd be strong enough to. 
And don't get me wrong, I had to stop several times during my playthrough and this editing to cry or just give my heart a break. Even before I played it, this game had a way of pulling at my heartstrings. I remember the early days after her death. My mind would often replay the awful sequence of events, something I've come to refer to as the dark place. I understand now that my mind did this because it didn't want to believe what had happened. It didn't want to accept it as reality. Because what I experienced that day was surely too terrible to be real, my brain replayed it over and over and over, trying to find some sort of logical fallacy to disprove it. Was it a dream? Was I in a coma? Was she really dead or just sleeping? Your mind demands you examine every fiber of the memory in full detail on repeat. Eventually, after thousands of times of coming to the same conclusion, acceptance slowly starts to set in, but it takes weeks, months, even years. I still have not fully accepted that she's gone. I may never in this lifetime. This cycle is not unlike the cycle that Amori goes through as he jumps between worlds. I miss my daughter so much. Playing through Amori has given me a small peek into her mind. It wasn't that long ago that I myself was 13 years old and struggling to navigate life. I wish I had done a better job of trying to help her navigate. I wish I had played Amori sooner. As difficult as playing it was, the game has given me a wonderful gift, a new connection with my daughter, a shared experience. I believe that someday, her and I will be reunited in the afterlife and we will be able to sit down together and talk about this game and what it means to each of us. Though it's certainly not for everyone and I wouldn't recommend any young kid play it, Amori is nothing short of a masterpiece. If you can handle a game with a dark narrative like this, do yourself a favor and give Amori a try. To Omocat, in the very, very small chance that you see this someday, a huge thank you to you and your team for the years of stress, anguish, hard work, and love that went into this project. I know your road was not an easy one to walk, but you should be proud for having walked it. You have truly created more than a game. You have created art, something powerful that has the ability to get people to better understand trauma and grief, something our society tries to avoid at seemingly all costs. I believe that you have made the world a better place and I appreciate you to no end. And to my daughter, if you're watching this, I love you kid, and I'm so grateful I got to be your dad. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and have ideas for other games that would be good for similar reviews, please leave a comment below. And remember to love yourself.